Hello everyone. Welcome to the third lecture of the course Statistical Thermodynamics. The topic for this lecture is a review of classical thermodynamics, specifically the concept of temperature. We all have an intuitive feel for temperature. We know that some things feel hot while others feel cold. Temperature is a measure of hotness or coldness of a substance. While studying thermodynamics, we want to be more precise about how hot or how cold something is. So, the question we need to address is how to quantify temperature. Answering this question requires the concept of thermodynamic equilibrium. Equilibrium as you know is a state of balance or stability. A system is said to be in thermodynamic equilibrium when its macroscopic or bulk observable properties are not changing. Macroscopic properties of matter are the ones we observe in our regular interaction with matter like temperature, pressure, volume, composition, and density. For example, if we have hot water in an insulated flask, this water is isolated from the surroundings and has a well-defined constant temperature. Similarly, if we have cold water in another insulated flask, it too has a well-defined temperature. Now, what happens when we mix the water in the two flasks? Does this mixture have a temperature? Well, for some time, the mixture does not have a temperature because it has not attained thermodynamic equilibrium. Suppose we are pouring hot water into the flask containing cold water. Then the water in the bottom part of the flask is initially cold and after interacting with the hot water, there is inhomogeneity in the mixture. The system, that is the water, is not in thermodynamic equilibrium. However, if we wait for some time, the mixture becomes homogeneous or in other words, it attains thermodynamic equilibrium and then it has a well-defined temperature.
temperature is a macroscopic or bulk property it is not always well defined it is only well defined when the system is in thermodynamic equilibrium note that this is true for all macroscopic or bulk properties which are the properties of matter which we usually measure contrast this with the properties of atoms and molecules of the substance which are always well defined now suppose a system is in thermodynamic equilibrium and we can assign its temperature to have a globally acceptable measure of temperature we use the zeroth law of thermodynamics i am sure most of you can state the zeroth law of thermodynamics but do you know why it is so essential in the context of defining a universal measure of temperature let's look into that let's first state the zeroth law if systems a and b are in thermal equilibrium and systems b and c are in thermal equilibrium then a and c are in thermal equilibrium for two systems to be in thermal equilibrium they must be in contact so that heat can flow between them the zeroth law allows us to define temperature globally because if a thermometer shows temperature t for system a and the thermometer shows the same temperature t for system c then we can say that a and c are in thermal equilibrium even though a and c are not in thermal contact i hope you realize that in this situation the thermometer is the system b and when we measure temperature the thermometer is in thermal equilibrium with the system whose temperature is being measured coming back to quantifying temperature we observe that things expand when they are hot consider a metal rod which expands when heated if the rod has a certain length l when in contact with the system a and has the same length l when in contact with another system b then we can say that both have the same temperature the actual value of the temperature can be arbitrary the metal's rod's length could be associated with a numerical value we all agree upon this is just like we arbitrarily define the meter to quantify length for practical convenience instead of a metal rod we often use a liquid expanding in a tube to quantify temperature an example of this is a mercury thermometer the thermometer usually has a bulb or a reservoir of mercury and a thin tube along which the mercury can expand the function of the bulb is to hold a large amount of liquid so that the volume of expansion is significant and can be clearly seen as the changing length of the mercury in the thin tube the actual markings along the tube are arbitrary for standardization historically the most easily available pure substance water was used the zero of the scale was set to the melting point of ice and the 100 to the boiling point of water at sea level the scale was divided equally into 100 parts and each part was a centigrade centi meaning one part of 100 and grade meaning a step this is also called the celsius scale while a liquid thermometer can be used to quantify temperature there is an issue associated with using different liquids all liquids do not expand at the same rate across different temperatures 
So, if two different liquids are used and the thermometers are calibrated using the method described earlier, they may not show the same value for a temperature which lies between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, although by definition they will show the same values at the endpoints. This problem is solved if we use a gas rather than a solid or a liquid as the substance whose expansion we consider to quantify temperature. And there are even more reasons to use a gas thermometer as we will see. A gas thermometer has the following design. There is a dilute gas in a cylinder with a movable piston head and there is a mass on top of the piston head whereby a pressure is exerted on the gas. The cylinder is put in thermal contact with the system whose temperature we want to measure. The product of the pressure and volume of the gas increases linearly with temperature. If the pressure is constant, then the volume increases linearly with the temperature. It does not matter what gas is used in the thermometer as long as the gas is very dilute. The PV as a function of temperature for a different gas looks like this but all gases will indicate the same temperature at all points because the rate of expansion of all gases is the same at any given temperature. Interestingly, if the gas is cooled below 0 degrees Celsius, then for all gases, PV keeps decreasing till it finally becomes 0 that is, the gas does not exert pressure anymore at T is equal to minus 273.15 degrees Celsius, the absolute zero. The PV versus temperature lines for all gases meet at absolute zero. Absolute zero is the lowest possible temperature and is one of the two points required to define the linear temperature scale. This point is set to zero in the scale known as the Kelvin scale. For other points on the Kelvin scale, rather than using the melting point or boiling point of water, we use the triple point of water. This is a unique combination of pressure and temperature where liquid water, solid ice and water vapor can coexist. At this point, temperature is 273.16 Kelvin and partial vapor pressure is 0 0.0060359 atmosphere. Incidentally, as recently as 2019, the Kelvin scale was redefined by setting an exact numerical value for the Boltzmann constant. In practical terms, this does not change things a whole lot. The difference from before 2019 is that earlier 
the triple point of water was taken as exact and the Boltzmann constant a measured value with a standard uncertainty. Now the Boltzmann constant is defined exactly and the uncertainty is transferred to the triple point of water which is a measured quantity. The advantage of the new system is that measurement of temperature at very low and very high values not close to the triple point of water will be more accurate because the techniques used for that depend on the Boltzmann constant. Also, now temperature is independent of any particular substance. You will be able to appreciate how temperature can be defined by fixing the Boltzmann constant as we go further in this course. An important point to note is that in thermodynamics discussions, we will always use the absolute temperature or the Kelvin scale. If you don't use the Kelvin scale while solving problems, you may get erroneous results. So please make a special note of this point. In the next lecture, we will look at quantifying another important thermodynamic quantity, namely heat. See you for that.